Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Two pilots who have been there and done that will regale us today. Let's welcome Mike Rabins and Roy Martin to learn about the surprises that can occur when testing prototypes and first article aircraft. Hey, Mike and I would like to uh, say thank you to Cindy and to the Western Museum of Flight for giving us this opportunity today to come and talk to you about a, a research paper we did called First Flight Anomalies. About a year ago, uh, or about a year and a half ago, Mike and I were uh, sitting down and looking forward to seeing that there were going to be some first flights uh, of first article airplanes uh, coming down the pipe. And we thought, huh, wouldn't it be interesting to go back and take a look at uh, some of the past first flights of first article aircraft to see what kind of anomalies might have occurred on those flights and to maybe dust off some of the old lessons learned. And that will be, today's presentation will be uh, a summary of our research that we did by looking at past uh, aircraft. We're not gonna talk about the specific type of aircraft per se, uh, what we are going to do is just reference it in generalities as a fighter or a bomber, but because we think it's more important to dwell on the anomaly that occurred and to get the lessons learned from that rather than to deal with the specific airplane. And what we did as we developed this concept is we realized it would be really important to pull people together for a team that was getting ready for a first flight in Northrop Grumman. And we were able to get people not just from Northrop Grumman, but from some other companies as well that had that first article, first flight experience, that personal experience. And I want to give due credit to the names you see on the screen right now for participating actively in that, willingly and generously sharing their lessons learned with an auditorium full of North Grumman people in this case. And, uh, and you're going to see some, just some, of those lessons learned today. So, we start off with a bomber program, and as they were building this bomber, it was gonna be new technology. They were very meticulous in trying to prevent FOD from getting into the system. And as they did the build process, and you have build and test starting to work together somewhere in here, they made a decision that anyone going into any of the fuel system tanks would wear this, at the time, relatively new, kind of suit, Tyvek type suit, that would keep, um, minimize, and in fact, reduce the risk of FOD. Well, as they get into the ground test program, they started realizing that they were having some pump issues, and they further analyzed that to determine that what had happened was, was that lint created by these new suits that had not been used before with the intention of preventing FOD where actually the lint was collecting in some of the filters in the sump system. And what they ended up having to do was after every dynamic event, every taxi event or anything else, when they stopped wearing the suits in the tanks, but they had to clean these filters after every dynamic event. And after a while, all the, you know, all that FOD material, that lint was in fact removed and they could continue with the program. But it was quite an unexpected lesson learned and, and what we, the reason we mention it here is because you have to have your eyes wide open as to what, what could possibly happen from any decision that's made, even one with the best of intentions. So sometimes um, first flight anomalies, their origin is actually beginning in the actual first taxi test, if you will. Uh, a friend of mine also had a problem with the fuel system. It didn't manifest itself on the first flight. Uh, this was a case where uh, uh, an experimental aircraft was built. Um, the um, uh, flight, the first flight was successful, but it was the second flight. Takeoff, high power setting, engine failure, the airplane crashed and a friend of mine was killed. Accident analysis showed that manufacturing debris had built up in the fuel filter, and even though the first flight was successful, the filter was contaminated to the point where the high power of the second flight is what uh, was the problem. So, kind of the lesson learned is even though you have a successful first flight, you need to stop, go back, and take a look at that airplane and make sure it's good to go and treat that second flight almost like another repeat of the first flight, as far as that goes. 
In addition, uh, I had a personal experience related to FOD. FOD manifests itself in, in several ways, and this was a cruise missile test. Now, in the control room, we had telemetry coming down from the uh, various uh, flight control computers that were inside the cruise missile. And we noticed when the cruise missile launched, it captured altitude, it captured track, and it was operating at full power, uh, attempting to accelerate. But in the control room, we noticed that the mock was kind of stuck at the launch mock number. And we thought, huh, it's a little slower to accelerate than what the simulator said, until all of a sudden Chase said, wow, this thing is getting fast. Fast? And then it went into a pitch PIO, put the parachute out and recovered the missile. Uh, what the uh, post-accident analysis showed was that manufacturing FOD again, during the th time that the missile launched and was in that zero G flight to a capture altitude, FOD drifted up and shorted out both air data transducers. So that the last input into the computer, the flight control computer, was that launch Mach number. And in the brain of that computer, it said, I gotta accelerate, I gotta accelerate. And so there was a case where FOD uh, uh, cost us the missile uh, by the fact that it wasn't just a fuel system issue, but it was also the electronic flight control. So I think this is a problem with modern flight control systems. One of the issues is that we have various sensors putting input into that to flight control computer. And if one of those sensors fails and continues to put in false information, then that could be a reaction that you get from the, from the computer. So it's something that we have to be aware of. And the good news is, is that our manufacturing people are extremely meticulous now across the industry because of these risks. So we, they recognize that it has to be good. So um, one of the common things that came up in our research was telemetry. And we're gonna talk about a, a couple of interactions between telemetry and communication. So, as a team was getting ready for their first flight and their first article, um, we have a job to get data in test. And the way you get data is you either onboard record it or you telemer it to a ground station or you do both, most programs do both. And to do that telemetry, you've got to use antennas and you don't really want to put extra antennas on an airplane, especially if you're later you're going to be doing signature measurements on that airplane. So you co-use an existing antenna. And in this case, what happened was they were going to use telemetry for the lower antenna and, um, and then, you know, continue to have the architecture where there would be um, comms off the upper antenna. Well, the way the comm system is set up is when you get airborne, as you can imagine, you know, the side, the antenna facing the ground is the lower antenna. And guess what happened on this particular flight <clears throat> they took off and the telemetry was using the lower antenna, the comm switched to the lower antenna, and they lost all communications to the outside world. All communications to Chase, all communications to the control room. Basically, they could talk amongst themselves, and they had some um, hot mic, that could, you know, the control room could hear them, but nobody could talk to anybody. Fortunately, you know, experienced crew, they figured out, we'll switch antennas, they regained comm and they were able to do that. But the instrumentation people, it, it, one of the lessons learned out of that is that the instrumentation system and, and the data system, they have to be part of these reviews to make sure that you catch those things before first flight. Yeah, not good to lose your communication from your cockpit out to the world on your first flight, but yet it did happen on that particular bomber aircraft. Uh, communication issues can manifest itself in other ways uh, again, kind of leading on a, a personal experience. Uh, this relates to uh, first flight of a fighter type aircraft. Now, on the first, this first one I'll talk about, things were done correctly, and then later I'll talk about a case where maybe not so correct. So on this first case, uh, the fighter was a first flight of first article aircraft, decided to have two chase airplanes, decided to do opposite direction takeoff from the normal landing runway at this base. And the reason was they wanted to have, in case there was a problem on takeoff, to be able to abort and have the ability to roll out on a late, long lake bed runway, if you will. So they're gonna use the opposite direction of the normal landing runway to do this. 
Now the scheme was also the chase aircraft will talk to the test aircraft using VHF frequency, and yet everybody will monitor UHF frequency for talking to the tower and the control agencies. All well and good. Since there were a lot of moving parts to this first flight, it was determined, and let's put a pilot up in the control tower that's knowledgeable for what's going on, and that way we can help tower sort out what's going on for this uh, uh, different uh, strategies. And that turned out to be also valuable because there was a large airplane of wanting to take off, uh, like a B-52, and that was going to churn the air up, and this pilot was able to talk the tower into hold that B-52, and let's let this first flight airplane take off uh, without having the air all churned up, if you will. So all in all, a successful first flight for this particular first article aircraft. Let's go two months later. Uh, we have the same exact aircraft, well, not the exact aircraft, but the same type aircraft, but it's got a different engine. So it really is a first flight again of the first article aircraft. Same scheme was going to be used. Use two chase, talking on VHF, and, and then have tower being monitored on UHF, except they did not deploy anybody to the control tower for this one. Well, how did the problem ensue? When they pulled, tower said, you're cleared onto the runway for takeoff. Now, the, uh, at the same time as the airplanes are pulling onto the runway, there's another airplane in the work area reporting to tower, hey, I want to come in and do a touch and go on the normal runway. Tower said, there's an opposite direction takeoff, hold your position out in the area, until I clear you in. So sure enough, when the two chase airplane take off and do the turn out of traffic, Tower thinks that's the airplanes that are taking off. They didn't realize they were going to be coming back around to do an airborne pickup on that airplane. So they think the aircraft have departed. So they tell the airplane and out in the work area, yeah, you're cleared to come in for your touch and go. Well, meanwhile, the chase came back talking on VHF, not being heard by the tower, and they called the release brakes. So now we have the test aircraft with the two chases taken off. We have the other aircraft coming in on an opposite direction. And as the test airplane rotates for takeoff, he looks up and sees the other airplane. Well, fortunately, it did not end up into an accident mishap. Due to some heavy maneuvering on the part of some airplanes, we were able to avoid the, the midair. But you see how a communication plan has to be thought through, and especially if you're doing things like opposite direction, take off to normal traffic, and you're doing frequencies that are not necessarily being monitored by everybody. Okay? Yep. Tower up. Remember that, tower up. And you had a pretty good view of that particular uh, near <laughs> uh, incident. Let's just say I had a front row seat. <laughs> so. Um, another telemetry issue. So, um, not like the first one. In this case, they, there was a, uh, an aircraft and the system was designed to transmit telemetry at low wattage on the ground and at a higher wattage on the, uh, in the air. It makes sense. You know, you're going to be up to 100 or more miles away from the receiving station, so you need to go high power. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was, is that when the aircraft got airborne and the system made that switch to low to high, all, everything went away. Telemetry went away, completely, completely gone. And, and now you have a situation where, and it wasn't recoverable by changing any switches, changing any modes. So you have to have a plan if that's to happen. You know, the, the ground had said, we're here for you, we would support you, but then what do you do? And when you get airborne, in that you know, multi-million dollar aircraft, what do you do to get as much reasonable data as you can, maintain your safety margins, and come back and, and, and land uh, safely without that control room being able to see any of the safety of flight or safety of test parameters? So, got to have a plan. Yeah, and the flight test engineer confided to me later, he said he confesses that he probably didn't do his job thorough enough. They used the low wattage an antenna for ground operations, but they needed the high wattage trans uh, you know, a transmitter for in-flight operations. So he said, we chose to say, wait off wheels, we'll do the transition, but he said at wait off wheels, there was a shorting of the high, the high wattage transmitter, and therefore they had no TM. He said he feels that he did not do an adequate ground checkout of that transfer system. Uh, had he had done that, he said they probably would have found this shorting capability. So anyway, but like you said, Mike, to be, we're promised we'll have TM 
on the first flight and we have scenarios where TM failed, so you better have a plan. I uh, had a case where uh, uh, we were doing a UAV test and this is another example where we did something right uh, and, and it, it allowed us to have a successful first flight. So uh, for UAVs, I'm a big proponent of what's called a surrogate aircraft to be used ahead of time before you fly the UAV for risk reduction. A surrogate is a manned aircraft that has the computer systems and the antennas of the UAV so that you can do the taxi task and do the flight and check your uplink, downlink events, check your telemetry and find out if there's any areas where you might have a problem in your work area. In this particular case, at this base where we're going to fly this UAV, it was noted with the surrogate that on the long runway we were going to use, as soon as we release brakes, we always had a TM failure. But a, a, a ways down the runway, the TM came back. Huh, so it, it was a repeatable. We had frequency management try to solve the problem at the base, they couldn't find anything. So we decided to go into the first flight of the UAV with the knowledge that if the UAV has a TM failure, we're not gonna abort, we're gonna let it go, and then hopefully it'll get the TM back, and that's exactly what happened. It happened just like the surrogate. So that's just an example of how we used uh, an aircraft ahead of time to see where there might be issues with TM, and especially for UAV, that can be pretty important. All right, so the first thing that's grabbing you if you're looking at the slide is what the heck are those people doing? <laughs> and this, this is not a staged photograph. This really happened where a civilian aircraft had a landing gear issue and <clears throat> uh, they tried to do some uh, in-flight troubleshooting, if you know what I mean. Safety officers are cringing when they see this picture. <laughs> that is not how you're going to handle a fighter, air, fighter airplane and in fact, um, First, I wanted to say that gear problems are very common. In, I would say, roughly half of the cases that we studied, programs had some kind of gear issue, um, yeah, fortunately not catastrophic, but some kind of gear issue. And in fact, on a recent program that I'm aware of, they did, in fact, have some gear issues because you've got air loads on doors and everything else. But what happened in this case? So a, a, a new fighter type uh, took off and um, the nose gear cocked and the interlocks were such that with a nose gear cocked, it wasn't going to retract, it wasn't going to come up. Now, uh, you can in a picture in your mind, you know, typical fighter type aircraft, um, you really don't have too many choices if the nose gear doesn't come down. And they had long, long discussions between engineering, the control room group, the pilot, and they came to the conclusion that to preserve the pilot, they should probably do a controlled ejection. <laughs> now the pilot wasn't too keen on being remembered as the one that gave that first article, you know, back to the taxpayers in that manner. So he made the decision in this case, he says, you know, I haven't tried everything. He had tried positive G, negative G, tried everything he could think of and that cock nose gear just wasn't changing. But he says to the ground, he says, this is what I wanna do. I wanna come down, I wanna do a touch and go, but not Navy style, I wanna, just kiss, just barely kiss that nose gear to the uh, concrete and see if that alone will realign that nose gear and then I'm gonna immediately apply power and take off again and what do I have to lose? And the control room said, sounds like a reasonable risk to take to us. So they said, go for it. The pilot did that, executed it just as I described a moment ago. It did realign the nose gear and they were able to then, uh, you know, come back and safely land, which is good. But, but you start, you have to think through all of these possible scenarios and have a plan. In this case, you know, it, it worked out because of some ingenuity too. And we want to really emphasize one point here. <clears throat> the first time you do a gear cycle, may not be on your first flight, maybe on your second flight, make sure you do that cycle early in the flight. Because if you do have a gear anomaly, you need to have the time and fuel to work the issue. So we want to uh, kind of pound that point home. Do your, do your gear ops early in the flight. In addition, we did have a test team told me that they actually planned for a possibility of a gear not retracting, just as a, as a plan. So they actually got pre-approved an alternate card. 
And the idea was, if the gear won't come up, show up and log, we'll put the gear down. If Chase says it looks good, if everybody agrees it looks good, then let's work this alternate card and, walk out, and work out a few data points to clear some flight envelope with the gear down and then come back and land. So it's kind of a way to save the mission. So you might want to consider one of those alternate cards for that. Now probably one of the more spectacular first flights occurred on a large prototype bomber. And in this particular case, it's a very interesting scenario. This airplane was designed so that when you put the gear handle up and the gear start to come up, they wanted the wheels to be stopped when the gear went into the well. So when you put the gear handle up, the, they actually started to apply brakes to the landing gear as the landing gear was retracting. And then this way, with, when the gear was up and locked, the brakes would be released. That was the design. However, what happened on the first flight? Gear handle raised, the gear did not come all the way up and locked. So, the pilots put the gear handle down, boom, they had a successful gear extension, let's go ahead and come back and land. But what they didn't realize was because the system didn't complete its cycle, the brakes were not released. So here's what it looked like when you have a landing with your brakes still being applied upon landing. And as you can anticipate, the first thing will be blown tires, soon followed by tire fires, and that will soon be followed by maybe some metal getting involved in the fire. And all in all, this could be a spectacular end to your first flight. So I thought it was a very interesting scenario in that you gotta think through, what if we do something and the cycle does not complete? Do we really know the issues that might be involved in this? Very interesting case, beautiful airplane, but that's not the way you wanna end your first flight. <clears throat> well, before you can ever get airborne uh, on any new vehicle, man to run man, you're gonna go out and do taxi tests. And uh, in this particular case, it was a prototype aircraft and as we often do when we make prototype airplanes, we're really focusing on taking a design, uh, maybe with a new flight control system or something else, and going out and wringing it out as a risk reduction me measure. And in that case, you often take legacy aircraft systems and reuse them. And in this case, this particular prototype fighter had used the nose gear and the nose strut and the nose wheel steering and everything, that whole assembly off of a legacy fighter, a fighter that had, you know, hundreds of, literally hundreds of thousands of hours. And they got out there and one of the things they were surprised with during high speed taxi is they had a pretty, not just noticeable, but uh, a, a, a little bit scary nose wheel shimmy. And so they kept troubleshooting and troubleshooting and they did the research and what they found out is that that particular nose gear, which was new and pristine coming off the shelf from the warehouse, had never had all of its tech orders incorporated in the real airplane, the real fighter program that that came from. You know, they, they found an issue, they fixed it, and they moved on. They had this TCTO, but that particular gear had not had the TCO, TCTO incorporated. So if you're working on a program and you're reusing, you know, parts that you think are fully vetted to reduce your risk, you have to do the research to make sure that they are truly up to date with all the uh, tech orders that might have been incorporated. Okay, and then another situation, and again, high-speed taxi and taxi can be very interesting. Going back to a large bomber program again, it was very interesting that the, uh, the pilots noted there was a little bit of a pull a little bit of pull to one direction. And in the debriefs, you know, they, they noticed it, it was controllable. And of course they're going from low speed to medium speed to high speed. And so they convinced themselves, uh, just like anyone might, that you know, this was a brake issue where the brakes uh, often need to be burned in or worn in or, or something which involves applications and heating. And, I, and, and I've personally seen that on UAV programs where you get differential braking uh, and it's because the brakes are, are broken in, you know, differentially, if you will. 
So in this case, they, again, they convinced themselves that this was a break wherein kind of issue. And, um, and it kind of came to a head on a flight. They came back and they landed from the flight on a very wide, 300 foot wide runway. And the pilots had their hands full with maximum braking and nose wheel steering to the maximum. And they still approached the edge of the runway on that wide runway. They went all the way to the edge. And that's when they threw the flag up in the debrief and said, okay, something is going on here that's not related to brake wearing. And what they found out through a series of engineering investigations is that the flight control folks had with the best of intentions put a mode in there to counter crosswinds. Mm -hmm. And so the crosswind part of the flight control system was feeding in flight control inputs on the ground with weight on wheels that the crew didn't know about. Um, you know, you have a huge program and you've got people running as fast as they can and that communication hadn't made it to the crew. So they took that mode out. The mode never reappeared in that very mature bomber program that's out there now, and it completely fixed the problem. So it was put in with good intentions, the crew didn't know about it, and it took probably a little bit too long to determine that was the cause of the drift. We dwell a little bit on high-speed taxi because probably in the world of flight tests, one of the most dangerous things we do is high-speed taxi. We do pretty good at taking off and flying and coming back and landing, but to take off and then abort at a high speed, that can be a pretty hazardous event. And we like to do the workup uh, using high-speed taxi events. Uh, but uh, I'd like to review uh, uh, a case where the high-speed taxi became the first flight. In this particular case, it was a prototype fighter, brand new flight control system concept. The idea was let's use a fixed stick and let the forces on the stick, and it was a side stick control, let's let the forces generate a pitch rate and a roll rate command based on the forces. And so they developed in the fixed base simulator the amount of pitch and roll rate that would be associated with the different forces. They then took this concept to the in-flight simulator. There's a company called Cowspan up in Buffalo, New York, and they do a great job of taking an airplane, has computers in it, and you can replicate another airplane with this known aircraft. It's called an in-flight simulator. And in this case, with this particular prototype, some of the test pilots that were flying said uh, they were concerned about the rapid roll response uh, based on the amount of forces that they were generating. And in case, they actually did have a case where one of the pilots came into the flare with the in-flight simulator and ended up in a lateral PIO. So they brought this up to management and management said, well, let's go ahead and do the high-speed taxi. We've already got that event planned. Let's continue to use what we know came out of the fixed base simulator. And if we have a problem in the high-speed taxi, then maybe we'll readdress it. Okay, however, in this particular case, the high-speed taxi was designed to take off down the runway and using like a mill power scenario and then get to just short of rotation speed, do a little roll input to see if the airplane is responding and then bring the pitch up just a little bit so as to get it light on the gear and do another roll response and then power back and abort. That was the plan. So let's see what actually happened on this particular high-speed taxi. So the pilot's down the runway. Now when he puts the roll control in, the airplane's trying to generate a roll rate, but the, the airplane's constrained. So that control just keeps driving and driving, trying to generate the roll rate. So then when he puts the pitch input in, he gets a little bit more than planned for. You see he gets in the air, he immediately wing drop, and now he's immediately in this lateral pilot-induced oscillation. The airplane actually touches down about four times during this event, but it starts to drift off the side of the runway, and the pilot says, enough of this, I'm into burner, I'm out of here. And once he got up and away, he was able to come out of the loop, let the airplane settle down, and then bring it back and landing. I asked the team later, I said, did you have a chase airplane? And they said, no, because we didn't plan on flying that day. So I guess what I'm trying to say, you gotta be, you gotta have the same risk reduction methods 
going into high-speed taxi that you would do going into your first flight because your high-speed taxi may become your first flight. In this particular case, the role response was reduced by about a half after the fact so that they didn't have this very high response to role, role mode, okay? Yeah. And I've been on several unmanned aircraft programs where we never allowed the airplane to get to a speed where they could actually lift off uh, for, for exactly that reason. Exactly. Right. So um, one of the things that has happened on every program, and, and you would think that human nature and intelligence would kind of prevent this from happening, but I've seen it happen on every program, and that is uh, on the ground, as you're going through the manufacturing, at some point you get test in to start checking the different systems to make sure they work and make sure the instrumentation for them works. And you're finishing the build and you're also testing. And now you've got people and you're often doing two shift operations. Sometimes you're catching up on weekends. And so there's a propensity for people to step on one another that panel is open. Is it in the logbook as it was open? Did somebody go back in from manufacturing or from test to take care of something that needed to be done? And every time, every single time, they come to the conclusion that one person has to be their vehicle manager and that there's different names for that, but one person is the czar, is the god of that airplane. And that one person says, you can get on the airplane and you can't because we are going to keep straight what's going on. In the control room, it's very analogous where you can't have um, so many people, a cacophony of voices saying, do this, do that. And that's why we have the test director. The test director is the equivalent. The test director maintains control of that control room and make sure that the people in there have a reason to be in there and there's no looky-loos in there and we don't have VIPs in the back asking questions of people that are supposed to be focused on the thing. One person in charge and they can say who stays and who goes so that you prevent uh, miscommunications and other accidents. Actually, I remember at Northrop we had a vice president and he was one day being pinged by multiple people pointing at each other. It was his fault, it was his fault. And this vice president said, I want one man to blame. And I thought, that's kind of a cool management style. I want one man to blame because if everybody <laughs> knows who the one man to blame is, now we got one guy in charge and we can move on. So I thought that was kind of an interesting management style. Uh, I'm going to kind of go away from the slides for a couple of uh, uh, events here. Uh, and, and just talk to you about a couple of, act, uh, of events that have come up to us after we prepared the briefing, because there's been some other inputs that have come in on first flight anomalies, and I just thought I'd share them with you today. In one of the case, a large bomber aircraft was on its first flight, was having some issues with things like flaps weren't operating correctly, uh, a couple of other systems weren't working quite right, but there was no caution or any indication that anything was wrong. In, after the landing and the post analysis, it was found that one of the electric buses had failed. But the light that would have told them that this bus had failed, that light was wired to the failed bus. <laughs> So I just wanted to pass on those things occur out there. And so that's the things you have to be concerned about. In a second case, very interesting story uh, came to us on a, a, a fighter aircraft, again, going into its first flight. Uh, the control room group was being trained and, and, and in their training, they were taught to, to uh, no, look at the flight card, let's review the card, let's do some anomalies and stuff. And then uh, the program manager for this particular airplane announced that, hey, I think we'll, have a, that we'll be ready for first flight like two weeks from now on a Friday. Well, the pilot went to the program manager and said, mm, wait a minute, don't announce ahead of time the date you plan on flying, because that puts a lot of artificial pressure on the engineers. Make the statement, we're going to fly when ready. We're going to fly when ready, okay? And, and then that lets everybody work along to get ready uh, without feeling the pressure. And the program manager says, yeah, I get that, and so it's good. So now it came up to the day of the first flight. And so the team had been trained up. The pilot went in that day to the team just before he went to the airplane to do the first flight. And he says, hey, control room, we've practiced, we've been through the card, you know what we're gonna do. Um, we've had a couple of uh, uh, anomalies or, or, or things, emergencies that we've talked about. Um, you all pick, pick the emergency today, what you think that we should 
you know, just, just pick an emergency out of the checklist and we'll, uh, uh, and we'll go through that and then we'll get ready to go fly. And nobody said much and he finally said, go ahead, pick something. So finally this one hand goes up in the back of the room and he said, yeah, what do you got? And he said, uh, avionics hot. Huh, the pilot thinks that's not what I would normally think. I said, I thought maybe they'd say engine failure or something like that. I said, okay, avionics hot. And he goes to his checklist and said, okay, shut down ECS system, return to base and land, you know, a couple other procedures in there. Okay, so he goes out to fly, gets in the plane, takes off, rotate, airborne, out of afterburner, guess what? Avionics hot. Whoa! Okay, so come back and uh, did the procedure because they just <laughs> talked about it. And he said, yeah, I shut that ECS system down on a hot and humid day. It's not fun in the cockpit because, you know, you're sweating trying to get the plane back on the ground. So when he gets down on the ground, he goes into the control room and he goes right to that guy that had raised his hand and he said, how did you know that we were going to have avionics hot? Well, last night we were doing some last minute tests in the systems integration lab and we kept getting avionics hot and we couldn't figure out how to turn it or what caused it or how to turn it off. He says, well, why didn't you tell somebody? Well, we were told that we had to fly tomorrow. We don't have to fly tomorrow, okay? That's the point I want to make is that uh, uh, we'll fly when ready. And if you've got an anomaly, let's work the anomaly. Okay. Anyway, Mike, let's yeah, right. uh, go on down the path. Go ahead. I had a recent boss that said, the, the plane is the boss. The plane will tell you when it's ready to go fly. And good so line. That's probably a good line. Good yeah. line, yeah. Right. So we've gone through some of these anomalies today, and there are themes. A lot of programs have telemetry issues. A lot of programs have landing gear issues. Um, you know, th those are very common, you, and you have to... Um, account for that. So you plan for gear operations early in a flight, as Roy said, you want to have fuel, which equals time, so you can deal with it. Um, we've also seen um, where FOD, despite the best intentions and the meticulousness of our manufacturing and test people, FOD is insidious and it can get in places and it can have consequences. So as you're doing your preparation, you want to be thinking about that, thinking about what do we do if. And uh, again, treat high-speed taxi as if it was going to be your first flight. Give it the same care and attention that you would have for that first flight. Maybe you want to have that chase airplane ready to go just in case. Um, when you're using legacy components from another airplane, uh, airplane system, that even though it's been proven on that airplane, it hasn't been proven on your airplane, but make sure you understand the legacy of those components. And if their modifications had been done on that original aircraft, you want to make sure that you've accounted for that on your, on your airplane. And again, like Mike said, one person in charge, whether that be around the airplane for the final prep or whether that be in the control room. There has to be that one person that can be in charge. Yep. So, um, in summary, I'll say the purpose of a first flight is that it's going to set the stage for usually as a years long campaign. And so for that reason, we want to get airborne. We want to do the initial assessment of handling qualities of the vehicle and things so that we know we can land safely. That usually involves maybe a half hour of some maneuvering tests and some other things, a simulated wave off and then come in and land because you wanna end a first flight with a very safe landing. Now in that first flight, you have systems that have been operated for maybe thousands of hours in system integration labs, but this is the first time that they all come together. And so one system can affect another system. Aerodynamic loads can affect gear doors and micro switches and things. So um, you have to, you know, avionics hot, so whatever it is, everything is now airborne for the first time in the real environment, and you have to walk through what those potential gotchas are gonna be and have team be ready. So how do we practice for anomalies? We practice, practice, practice. That's how we prepare. We set the team, we identify the team ahead of time that's gonna be in the control room. We go through the flight card, we understand the pacing of the card, we understand the different responses we expect from people, and then we inject a couple of anomalies and let them think about what they're gonna see on their displays and what kind of response they're gonna to make to the test director so that we have a, an organized method of handling that anomaly when it does occur. What you practice, 
will probably not be what actually happens, but because you did practice, you'll be ready for what does happen. And for, I would just say, for those that aren't familiar with flight test, you've got a control room, you've seen it in the movies, and when you do these rehearsals, you've got the right people in the right seats looking at mock telemeter data or simulated data in their seats. You've got the pilots in the simulator. So it is, it is truly a, a mission rehearsal with very high fidelity. Exactly. So uh, Mike and I just want to summarize by saying uh, we, we've had the opportunities to be a part of first flight teams. And I think you will agree that probably in flight tests, your greatest experience can be in whatever role, but to be a part of a first flight team. It's kind of the pinnacle of your flight test career. So if you're a young engineer out there and you get assigned to a flight test team or a young mechanic or whatever, uh, enjoy the moment because it is awesome. Again, our thanks to the Western Museum of Flight for allowing us to make this presentation today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We Thank enjoyed you. sharing these lessons.